Hello guys, thank you very much for being with us. We are just having a very prestigious guest, our friend Ben Johnson. I would say the guru, the legend and the father of Perpetual Chess Podcast. And in a moment we'll be having the opportunity to talk with him. And our uh, title of the meeting is Chess World and Chess Community. How to find your place in this space. And therefore, welcome to the stream, my friend. How are you? I'm well, happy to be here, yeah. Um, it's good to, you know, Tomas, you've been chiming in in the Perpetual Chess Facebook group probably, I feel like, all six years that the podcast has existed. So I'm happy to finally put uh, a voice um, to, and I've seen your picture, but now I can actually put a voice to, uh, to the comments. Yeah, I'm super happy, by the way. For those of you people who may not know it, I am one of the biggest Ben Johnson fan and Ben probably uh, may not have uh, known me before because I was not that much, I would say, visible. But after some point, Ben was something like that. Thomas, you are doing great job. And I will yeah, just exactly. make a little bit of bragging because one of the guests in a moment will say which one was promoted by me that I told you, Ben, some, somebody is, tr is tromping on your, on your area. Remember? <laughs> That's right. Do you remember uh, so, which one? No, I don't. You it was Luka Popov. Luka Popov. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. oh, that's right. Yeah, the, you, you tipped me off. Yeah, and then yeah. I interviewed him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why after this moment, it was something like that. Oh my goodness. Thomas, I need to look at you a little bit closer. And I was something <laughs> like that. Ben, you are doing such a great favor to our community that everybody should promote you. But before we'll just get into detail, let's get started about your journey with chess. So I'm like, how did you start it? The, uh, chess journey so like in the general way most often uh, how you just familiar with the game who taught you how did you start uh, let's a little bit about that sure so i learned how to play from a family friend when i was six but i didn't know uh, and i loved it right away but i didn't know about tournament chess until i was 12 when there was uh, a chess team forming at my middle school uh -huh. and uh, the kids were playing at lunch so i asked them and they told me when the club met so i came around after school and the rest was history you know as soon as i knew chess existed i felt drawn towards it so it was just a matter of finding out that there was a bigger world because when i learned how the pieces moved no one in my family played and this was you know i'm old this was even before internet chess club so if you didn't have someone to play with you couldn't play so it took a while for me to like find the world but i was hooked once i did mm -hmm. and uh, to, to to make a little bit more into this why didn't you let's say choose another endeavor for example the other type of game but just chess because of course these were the days that the, some kind of video games has started to pop up something like you can just have a choice because nowadays it's pretty much different but why chess attracted you that much that it was you were hooked on chess why is that well you know there's this famous director woody allen who's kind of canceled now in the united states you can't really quote his movies but he has a line in any hall the heart wants what it wants you know you you know you you can try to rationalize all you want for why you like something but chess just sort of grabbed me by the heart and i didn't have that much of a say in it really but i did have other interests i was really into sports as a kid mm -hmm. um the two of the popular ones here are baseball and basketball those were probably my primary interest as sports i wasn't like amazing at them mm -hmm. but i played them a lot um and so but chess definitely filled the void for when you're not outside uh playing sports mm -hmm. Probably it is one of the endeavor that you can play all 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 seasons, right? No matter if exactly. it's rainy or no matter if it's windy, you can just play chess no matter where is the location. And that's why nowadays, even with the online, it's pretty much the universal, let's say global, right? Yeah, that's one of the things I love about chess. I love that it connects people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of feel like I know people everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and that would not be the case without chess. Yeah, okay, excellent. Like the World Cup, you know, like when I uh -huh. watch like Croatia and Argentina, Tina, I'm thinking of like Agat Mater and Grandmaster Sandro Moreco oh. <laughs> instead of just thinking of uh, the, the, the people. Um, Familiar the people, with? Um, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's great because this way we are just, let's say, making the chess world united and we'll be talking about this topic as well. And uh, the, the other question, by the way, this time we'll be making a little bit of speed run, right? Therefore, okay. I'm just having the series of questions. And if you can just uh, make it some like a little bit faster, it would be great because we are just having 45 minutes. Is it correct? Uh, 
Sounds good. Yeah, unfortunately, I got to put my kids to bed. Uh, Perfectly fine. Minutes Perfectly fine. No problem. Thank you very much for being with us. The other question is something like connected to the previous one. How did you develop your potential? I mean, especially at chess. What have you done to make that into the national master level? Yeah, well, most of my growth came as a teenager and I was kind of I was in a good chess culture. Um, my school had some other strong players. We traveled to a lot of tournaments and I always have to give credit to the Shahadis, Jennifer Shahadi, mm -hmm. her, her, her older brother, Greg, is an international master. He's one year apart from me in school and we were fast friends as kids. Um, and their dad is also a, what's called a life master, which is basically, he's a fide master. Uh -huh. um, and so I was spending a lot of time at their house and was just sort of, you know, they had a lot of chess books on their shelves. They got all the chess magazines. Um, so I was kind of able to soak in the culture through them. So, you know, we talk so much about training methods on the podcast on perpetual chess, mm -hmm. but I was one of those people who I was, I was living the chess life, mm -hmm. but beyond that, I wasn't like training per se. I read some books, but I didn't think of it as training or work. I was just interested in it. Um, so yeah, it came easier to me back then for mm -hmm. sure. The, the right environment, if I understood, right? What's that? The right environment that yeah, you, exactly. you were in the, into the chess community. Another yeah. question connected to this one, if you can name three elements that help you to um, help you the most to become national master, just three elements. Uh, let's see, playing a lot of tournaments, mm -hmm. um, having a strong chess culture, yeah. um, and reviewing your games, I'd mm -hmm. say, were the three biggest for me. Okay, thank you very much. And now the question from one one of my uh, one of my viewers, Mike. He 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 asked me to ask you about how you get started with the podcast and how you managed to be get, to make it the biggest one on the planet Earth. Oh well, shout out to Mike. Um, uh, first of all, I don't know if it's the biggest anymore. You know, like uh, Kristen Carilla and uh, Fabiano Caruana. Are they are just going. They're just going up. They are not no 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 up uh, no above you. Therefore, don't yeah, worry. I don't know. I mean, they're amazing. I, I yes, they're amazing them. as well. Yeah. I love listening to it, so um, I don't really think of it. And mm -hmm. you know, they're obviously like I can't provide Caruana's perspective. You know, that guy's a legend. So, um, so I, I'm excited to listen to them. But anyway, um, I just uh, when I started the podcast back in 2016, there was very little in terms of chess podcasts, mm -hmm. and and I'm interested in chess culture. I love the stories. You know, you, I knew enough chess players where you hear some funny stories, you hear some behind the scenes stuff, um, and I knew enough well-known people in the chess world, and I had enough other interests where I said, you know, people are doing this sort of thing where they do interviews, focused interviews on a on a niche topic, mm -hmm. on a lot of a lot of different topics, yeah. but no one's doing it for chess. Um, so I figured I'd give it a try and and see if there was an audience. Um, and it's grown slowly and steadily from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Another question connected to this one, of course, it's how many people and in what way supported you during this journey of chess podcasts? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, anyone who's ever listened has supported me as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's like, you know, in the hundreds of thousands for sure um, that have listened to at least one episode. Um, and but I mean, in the early days and there's still there's a Patreon page for Perpetual Chess, like after about six months, people, a few people started donating and that that able that helped me keep making the time mm -hmm. um, um, because I was uh, working as well and uh, it wasn't so easy. And I've got two kids who they're now ages six and nine. Yeah. So uh, my podcast is about the same age as my little girl. Um, so it's always uh, easy to remember. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's tons of people, but obviously I would give a special shout out to the people who supported the podcast early. And of course, there's people I knew in the chess community that helped me get guests early on, uh, such as uh, Greg and Jennifer Shahadi and Jan Gustafsson, who are just kind of by a quirk I've known for 20 years. Um, so uh, he was an early guest and came on a couple times. I mean, he's been on like five times now, but in the early days, especially, it made a big difference to have someone uh, that funny and that well known come on. Yeah, well known probably helped uh, even more, right? Because people were attracted for the, let's say, known personalities, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. question. How do you search for the various chess guests? How do you search um, for them? 
How do I get? How do I find yes. them? Yes, yes. How do I find um, it? How do you make them connection with them and inviting them into the podcasts? Yeah, it's different for every person. When I launched the podcast back in the day, Greg and I just made a shared Google Doc where we listed mm -hmm. everyone who might be a good guest, and already we had something like 150 names. Um, now I'm on past episode 300 of the podcast, um, and obviously as the podcast has gotten more popular, it's not as challenging as it used to be to find guests. Sometimes it's a matter of excuse me sometimes it's a matter of trying to find a balance of the right guests mm -hmm. um and there are some people that are that are not so easy to to track down but i try not to like if i have a guest on the show like if i have like you know Sfiddler came on the show fairly early mm -hmm. you know i'm not going to just ask him to put me in touch with magnus or something yeah you know? yeah like, that's like a breach of etiquette as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. so i kind of let things happen organically i look for who has um I look for who has, uh, you know, public websites, public social media, try to reach out to them that way. Um, or if there's like a good friend, like good friend of mine that mm -hmm. knows someone that's really well known, I don't mind asking, but I'm not going to, someone who's come on your show, they're kind of doing you a favor. So I'm not going to like ask them, mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, uh, you know, put me in touch with, um, Kasparov, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, so, so mostly I, I do some detective work and let it happen naturally. Otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm excellent. not doing very well with the speed run. Sorry for the long. No, it's okay. It's perfectly fine. Okay. Take notice that I'm controlling. That's why I'm just looking a little bit st step by step. Okay. I'm okay. controlling the time and the I questions. Sorry. Okay. You can mute me if I go too long. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'll right. be, of course, interrupting if you're going to. There, now it's okay. perfectly fine. Uh, a little bit of, uh, let's say, make make it a little bit funny. I'll try to make a little bit of, out of your world cloud to make the interviews with some of your friends, for example, with Cyrus Laquadala, Jakob Ogard, right here on Twitch. Therefore, you know, there's the helper right there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, another question. Who was the most difficult guest to invite and why? Hmm. If you can remember, of course. Yeah. Well, what 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 would I would follow up? What would make them difficult? Like a lot of emails yeah, back yeah. and forth. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I've only been stood up a couple times. I don't really want to put anyone on. No, no. Blast. You do not need like, to put the names. Rather, some like the yeah. process and maybe some like the descriptive stuff that we do not know who is that. But for example, what kind of function? For example, chess arbiter, maybe chess instructor, chess coach, maybe something like the person from the one. Top 20 no, of the list, some like in a general form. Okay, there have been a couple super GMs that have been a little harder to track down mm -hmm. than others. Like one just forgot to show up, you know, at the given time. Uh -huh. But that interview did happen a couple of days later. Like I, I eventually sent an email follow up. Yeah. Um, and, and they did show up. Another one just kind of stopped responding after having agreed to do mm -hmm. the interview. So, and those people obviously they especially if they don't have like a course or a book to promote or something, yeah. they kind of have the least to gain out of coming on the show. Um, so I, you know, I never hold grudges or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that my white whale, the person I have the most trouble, it always puts me in an awkward situation because people always say, hey, when are you gonna get Yaz on the podcast? When mm -hmm. is, when is uh, Sarawan yeah. gonna come on? And I've tried, it just, I haven't been able to make it happen. So I mm -hmm. guess they, they call that, you know, they call that your white whale. It's a reference to this famous novel, Moby Dick, like you're trying to chase this whale. Mm -hmm. um, so Sarawan is my white whale for now. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, by the way, our friend Oli Paz from uh, Iceland. Thank you very much for support. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Oli Paz. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. And now another question, just, just briefly, because uh, of course we are just limited with time. Chess and poker. How much poker helped your chess and chess helped your poker? like from the mutual support of these activities good question okay so yeah i was a professional poker player for seven years um in my late 20s and 30s and chess helped my poker immensely because mm -hmm. i was already a uscf master and i kind of knew how to take a um a studious approach to games mm -hmm. and what i was saying about the importance of analyzing your games uh, a lot of people poker a lot of people it was kind of in its early days at that point um and a lot of people didn't have as analytical approach so i and a lot of other chess players including greg shahadi were pretty successful at poker because of that in terms of how poker helped my chess 
the main answer is not much, but the one thing is I was pretty successful at poker. I have made a lot of money uh, for, for seven years and got to travel the world and had a great time. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of burnt out of uh, poker um, towards the end and I didn't really want to do it anymore. I'm, I like a lot of chess players, I'm an introvert. I'm quiet uh, when I first meet people and stuff. Um, and what I regretted in my poker career as I looked back on it was that I didn't start a blog. I didn't like try to promote myself because mm -hmm. I had a reasonable amount of success. I had like a million dollars in tournament winnings. Wow. Um, yeah, in poker, but no one knew who I was because mm -hmm. I just, I never got first place in a tournament and I wasn't like really promoting myself. So when I came back to the chess world and was no longer doing poker, needing to sort of build some sort of career in chess, mm -hmm. part of what put me over the top of like, you know, you're going to do this podcast, you're going to try this thing, mm -hmm. is I had learned this lesson from poker that if if you don't network with people, if you don't create a community, mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot harder for our opportunities to present themselves yeah like i would have liked in poker to like i got tired of making my own money but if if i had some sponsorship deal that would have been great but no one knew who i was so that mm -hmm. wasn't gonna happen um so i that was the one thing that that poker helped me with in chess when i came back to it mm -hmm. okay thank you very much now guys you know just a little bit of let's say announcement and reminder ben johnson is the former poker star and he's even better, uh, the worldwide chess promoter of chess ideas, people, organizers, and all of these guys. Therefore, thank you very much for your service for our community. Another sure. question. And I should say, though, when you win, when you win a million dollars in a poker tournament, it doesn't mean you have a million dollars in the bank, you know, because that doesn't count like the the entry fees, which mm -hmm. cost money, and you pay taxes. So I was I did I was very happy with with how I did in poker, but it doesn't, you know, just wanted to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are just we just know that you are not a millionaire at this moment. <laughs> not yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great stuff, Ben. Great that stuff. is a safe assumption. Yeah, safe assumption. Okay. And now let's get into chess improvement because this is our passion because both of us are pretty much hooked about this even more. Chess improvement. What are the conclusions based on your research and all the chess improvement podcast series? Yeah, well, my conclusions, it's funny. Uh, different things work for different people is the conclusion mm -hmm. which is kind of not what you would want to hear because people just want to know what to do you know they're just like please just just tell me what to do yeah but <laughs> but it's amazing like you know some people swear by old books other people do it all by playing blitz online mm -hmm. i mean so what i try to focus on is there's certain things we know for sure, you know, like we know for sure that doing tactics mm -hmm. um, is good for your chess. Um, I know for sure that playing competitively, playing games that matter to you, yeah. uh, ideally tournament chess, but if if you can't get to tournaments, maybe like the, the Lee Chess 45, 45 league, mm -hmm. some, something that, that feels more important than just like rolling out of bed and playing a three minute game on your phone. Yeah. Um, because when you play in these high stakes environments, um, it leaves an imprint and you really sort of imp are able to learn the lessons much more. So to me, it's some combination of daily practice and tactics and competitive games. Mm -hmm. And probably the one stuff that probably uh, is, uh, is pretty much nice to mention is that whenever you're playing long time control games, be it the online over the board, but I mean the longer time control, you need to calculate a lot of stuff right this is like a, another work that you do instead of just clicking very quickly like a blitz do you agree on that for sure yeah and playing um, i've been playing tournament chess again the past few years mm -hmm. and it's like it's the only time i can concentrate on anything mm -hmm. like i i mean i love to read I, I read chess books i read other books um but these days I'm constantly checking my phone. I'll have a book in one hand and my phone in the other, mm -hmm. you know? And meanwhile, if I go play a tournament chess game, the time just slips through your fingers. You yeah, know, just yeah. Really the time distortion, right? The time yeah. distortion. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's actually, you know, there's a lot that is challenging about playing chess as you become like a working adult. Um, but that's the one thing that keeps me coming back is like, finally I can, you know, sink my teeth into something. Yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, another one, chess research. I mean, especially two names that you just have the guests to uh, bring into their podcast, Christopher Cabris and Vishu Shekumar and others. I mean, especially the guys from the scientific field. What are the conclusions based on their input from their perspective? If you can share yeah. it. 
It's funny because those two, I feel like they have slightly different conclusions, even though they're in the same field as mm -hmm. cognitive scientists. So Christopher Chabrie, who's, uh, we're lucky to have him in the chess community because yeah. he's kind of a big deal in uh, the broader world. He uh, co-wrote a best-selling book called The Invisible Gorilla. It's this, um, based on this very famous YouTube video where mm -hmm. some people are playing basketball and like a gorilla walks across the court. Yeah. And he, for some reason, no one sees it because there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. So he's very good on the cognitive stuff. Um, but what he, he's he's a he's kind of a cautious guy. He's slow to draw conclusions. But what he's talked about is the difference between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and fluid intelligence is like your ability to see patterns quickly, your ability to crunch numbers quickly. And Christopher has said that that unequivocally favors the young. Yeah. Uh, Vishnu Srikumar and cr crystallized intelligence is uh, is. Uh, knowledge that has already seeped in. Mm -hmm. um, so there's certain fields where they've seen that no matter what your age are, is, you might not, you might get better mm -hmm. as time goes on. Like if you're a lawyer or you're an author, uh, those aren't skills where you're rewarded for thinking quickly on your feet. It's more for drawing um, precise conclusions after a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. um, and chess involves both uh, crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. But the bottom line is if your fluid intelligence is bad in chess, it's or is subpar it's gonna cost you sooner or later mm -hmm. you're gonna get short on time you're gonna make a blunder in the fourth hour of a game so to me what I've learned from Christopher is that's part of the reason that uh, chess can be so unforgiving as you get older. But Vishnu Srikumar is an accomplished adult improver that I interviewed a couple years back, mm -hmm. who and at the time was getting his postdoctor doctorate and became um, a cognitive scientist. But he's adamant and wants to research. He feels like age is just a number. He feels like um, all the people who come on the podcast and complain about it they overstate how hard it is to get good at chess when you're an adult and he feels like the primary reasons that adults struggle compared to kids are situational it's because kids have so much more time mm -hmm. um, to play um, and and they're in a chess culture and adults are kind of checking in and checking out based on their responsibilities so he wrote a blog post on Lee chess that you can find I think if you search for like Vish chess mm -hmm. blog or something like that I can send it to you later Tomas if people are interested so that's that's his argument and that's what i love about chess is that like two smart people can disagree and we don't really have data you know mm -hmm. um, but i will say anecdotally from interviewing so many people yeah uh it's so rare that people make huge jumps after the age of 40 mm -hmm. that i think there has to be some sort of biological reason uh involved at least partially yes you got the point because i have another question a little bit of uh I would say teasing, but take notice it's something like a little bit for a while, okay? You okay. know what is dev devil's advocate? Yeah, devil's, yeah. Let's do it for a while. Just one question with the devil's advocate. When you, okay. have, n when you have not played chess before reaching adulthood, your chance to become a chess master is close to zero. Close to zero. Prove me wrong. Uh, that's funny, because I just interviewed someone today. The interview hasn't come out yet. Uh-huh. He played his first tournament and he had he was his first rating was 1200 he had no real experience beyond that at the age of 33 he's now 48 and his uscf rating is about 2030 or something Whoa. so um so he's he's knocking on the door i mean he's not at master mm -hmm. um so but i would say i mean i know you're playing devil's advocate but uh -huh. i would say like one should if someone is getting into chess and they're they're doing it to become a master mm -hmm. they shouldn't do it because the odds are so so stacked against you yeah um i would say if there if there is a chance there's pro i'd say there's probably people who have done it i'm not sure who they are mm -hmm. um but but it's got to be less than a one percent chance of like a random person who starts chess at the age of 40 from scratch it's got to be less than one percent that they make it especially to fide master but even to uscf master which is probably a, a hundred points lower mm -hmm. um I, I, it's it's tough
Yeah, yeah, and I looked. But at... Then there's also as as sorry, just yeah, yeah. quickly. There are, there are life circumstances like mm -hmm. you know if someone had unlimited money and was going to spend six hours a day, mm -hmm. sure, maybe you could do it. But most people don't have those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And in the meantime, our mutual friend Cyrus Laquadala, you probably already know it, has the contract about the book, right? Yeah, that should be good. Yeah, yeah but it... notice he was 19. Like I, I did like. Yeah, but it's, it... it's different when you're in your nine when you're in your 20s. Yeah, of course, of course. But what I what I'm Super interested. It's Cyrus Lakodala that he's just making this pretty much very legit. At the same time, if I remember, at the age of 17, he was just 1800, right? For today's yeah. standards, it's some like a little bit of laughable. And therefore, I guess it would be really nice if he just show us at least the methods that work for him or didn't work, right? Therefore, we can make yeah. some kind of comparison and expand our horizons. That's from, from my perspective. Yeah, for sure. Okay, another one, very quickly. Chess and social media. TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. What do you uh, think about I'm, it? What, what, what I'm, do... I'm a yeah, uh -huh. I'm a Twitter guy. I'm a words guy. Um, I like books. That's why I started a podcast. And Twitter is like for information addicts. You mm -hmm. know, um, I have uh, I have a lot of interests outside of chess. I'm a big sports fan. I follow politics here in the U.S. I follow the news. Um, I would like to read literature, um, and I'm able to sort of. Um, to drink from all those when I'm on Twitter. In um, Instagram, I'm not like, I'm not, it, it, if people regularly listen to my podcast, it comes across that I'm not a big visual image guy. Every time I interview a YouTuber, I've like barely seen their videos. I try to I try to watch them to prepare. Mm -hmm. I hardly ever watch chess Twitch. Um, so when it comes to like Instagram and TikTok, I did actually start a TikTok channel. Mm -hmm. Like yesterday, I have like nine followers and no one's ever gonna watch it, but. <laughs> It's so popular and I'm I'm too old for it obviously, but it's so popular that I feel like I have to try it. So I'm gonna do little summaries of the podcast, at least until I you know, I'll give it six months and if still no one's watching, I'll s i might stop. But um but and Facebook I just feel like um it's just I dislike well now I dislike Musk too mm -hmm. for Twitter, so who knows how long I'll last there. But <laughs> I really dislike Mark Zuckerberg and it kinda I do enjoy the some of the chess communities, but kinda sours the whole experience for me. Mm -hmm. I, so I try to sort of just get in and out on Facebook. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm not sure if this question is appropriate at this moment, but I'll just ask him anyway. Chess and live streaming especially Twitch, but not exclusively, but chess and live streaming. What do you think about this form of promotion? I think it's fantastic. So many people are amazing at it and I totally get why it's so popular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's great. And can you say that Finger Teacher, it's me, it's fantastic? <laughs> What's that? Can you say that Finger Teacher, I'm a Finger Teacher, my nickname, that can you say oh, that okay. Finger Teacher is fantastic promoter of chess? Finger Teacher is fantastic, yeah. <laughs> We have it, guys. Just clip you got, it. You got the clip. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we just need to have a clip. Okay, thank you very much for that. And now another one, chess and YouTube. Do you think that the quality of YouTube materials are good enough to learn for the people who started uh, started chess? Absolutely. They're amazing. I would encourage people to try to find something that's... Um, that's a bit linear in terms of how it progresses, whether it be like an Eroditsky speed run or um, Chess Network's um, Beginner to Master series, um, Bartholomew's Chess Fundamentals series, you know, rather than just like randomly, if you're trying to be systematic about it, rather than just like randomly popping on or sort of like, you know, uh, Agadmater, like he does a great job with the game recaps, but I think they're probably not, if your goal is to improve your chess, they're probably not the uh, the best way to go. But yeah, I mean, you can you can get good at chess on a very low budget. And um, if you enjoy YouTube videos there, there's tons of great stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And the question that is pretty much recent one, especially from our chat, because I didn't intend to ask it, but anyway, it's pretty, pretty short and, and funny. What about chess boxing? Oh my goodness, yeah. So <laughs> I... I don't know how many of you guys watched it. I mean, I, I, it's the weekend, so I was with my family, so I couldn't be like, hey, I'm gonna go watch this chess boxing thing for six hours. <laughs> um, but I did like, I was kind but of at, keeping But at least did you, did you watch the highlights at least a little bit? Yeah, I actually, I managed to catch like exactly mm -hmm. the Belenkaya Botez yeah. fight and the Trent fight and not like nothing else. So mm -hmm. it was perfect in that regard. But it's, it's not for me, I'm not judging it. Um, it, it brought an incredible amount of viewers mm -hmm. that, that can only be a good thing um, but it's not really for me I'm just not I'm not a um, UFC fan 
I'm not a mixed martial arts fan. I'm not a boxing fan. I don't really like watching people hit each other. Mm -hmm. So um, the same as me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go for the next one because we are absolutely very well, uh, let's say, connected to each other. Chess boom, lockdown, pandemic, Queen's Gambit. Now it is something like a full year after the boom is over. What are the changes? I mean, the changes that are a little bit permanent. Okay, well, you forgot one. So there was lockdown, pandemic, Queen's Gambit, and then cheating scandal boom. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it because I just put it away from my memory. Yes, correct. Yeah, it, <laughs> How do you really evaluate it? Uh -huh. At least for the podcast, it attracted a lot of interest, and I know a few friends, friends from childhood, who who had quit chess but got back into it uh, once they started following that story. But I just feel like chess has sort of found a new level where it's not as popular as during the pandemic, obviously, but it's more popular than it was before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can grow from that level. That's that's sort of where I think we are. Uh, I mean, there are so many fantastic presenters and the online tools are so good that overall I'm uh, reasonably optimistic about the future of chess. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Another one, chess podcasts, community and creators. Which one do you listen, recommend, or do you think is the community growing or a little bit stalling after some time? Um, yeah, I don't know how I would gauge if the community is growing, um, perpetual chess, like it did have a bump during the, um, the Hans Niemann thing, but other than that, it's kind of holding steady, I would say. Um, I love the Chicken Chess Club, it helps me keep up with, uh, all of the top level news and I love the C Squared podcast. Um, there, there's lots of good ones. I, the other ones, so those I listen to, say, 80% of the episodes, those two. The other podcasts, like Chess Journeys and um, 64 and some, some of the others, like, um, I tend to pick and choose more mm -hmm. which ones I listen to based based on the guests. But, uh, but, do, but you I mean, do you listen to them regularly or some, like, pick up the stuff that you like? Uh, more the latter for for the other podcast because mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm part of the reason I started Perpetual Chess. I am a podcast junkie, mm -hmm. but but I, again I'm following all these sports. I'm following politics, so I listen to a lot of non-chess podcasts, comedy podcasts, so a lot of stuff okay. outside of the chess world. And there's only so many hours, you know. Yeah, right? yeah. The the, the 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 day is just 24 hours. We cannot extend it, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another one. A little bit of uh, for, for for you. A, a little bit insight, if you can, of course, reveal what are the plans for your chess activities, especially uh, it is uh, uh, from me, uh, especially the question, are you going to write a book about chess improvement and maybe with the, another offer? For example, Nate Solom, all of the guys who are from a little bit of, uh, let's say, uh, academia stuff, maybe something like that. Yeah, I've so... Yeah, I'm I'm writing a book. I, it's probably 70-75% written and it's kind of like a compilation of uh, adult improver insights and it's got different quotes. Um, I've gone back and forth about like how it's going to be published, but I think I'm going to go with one of the chess publishers. Um, hopefully have some news on that soon, but I think we're looking at it, it'll be a while before it comes out, something like September of 2023. But uh, but it's really going to happen for a while. It was one of these things I was working on where I was like, I don't know if anyone's ever going to see this, mm -hmm. but um, I was it was stopping me from pursuing other projects. And I do think I've got I'm proud of what I've done. It needs work, but I'm I think there's something there. So you, it's coming. Mm -hmm. If you would like, if you would need some kind of proofreader, the guy who would, who would make a little bit of consultation, I open for you. Just let me know. Oh, thank you. I might take you up on that for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. I'll be honored. I'll be honored because I know how passionate you are, how much hours of the and dev how, how devoted you are on this topic. And I know that sometimes if you are into the topic very deeply, it is great to have some kind of consultants, right? Even if yeah. I'm not a title player, but I can make some kind of maybe suggestions, maybe some recommendations and so on. Great, thank you, Tomas. Okay, you're welcome, my friend. And now uh, the question from our friend Sebastian. Uh, he says, would you say that all luchas improvers are misguided by measuring their progress by ratings? And another question, would you say there is a community that encourages measure progress of adult improvers in some other way than educational way? That would be great, yeah. Um, it's not so much that I think they're misguided, it's just that I do worry that it's unhealthy. Um, I always encourage people, per what we were saying earlier about how hard it is to get better as you're an adult, I always encourage very modest goals in terms of what you have. And if you can find one that's not measured by uh, rating or wins and losses, all the better. Like if you can, like, you know, try to have zero blunders or 
uh, you know, try to use a certain amount of time in the game um, or something like that, all the better. But I'm a little Sebastian. I do feel like it's human nature. People love to measure each other. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this rating system exists, we're always going to be swimming against the tide. You know, I, I preach this. But at the same time, if my blitz rating goes below 2200, suddenly I want to get those rating points back, even though no one's paying attention, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is an element of uh, it's it's inescapability about the whole thing. But certainly to the extent that you personally and uh, all of us personally are able to um, judge ourselves um, about more important things, then, mm -hmm. then I'm all for it. Okay, thank you very much. Another question, chess book collectors. What do you, uh, what do you think about this group and why books are your favorite type of content? Yeah, it's amazing how many people are in that group mm -hmm. and, um, and all, the, all the suggestions that they have. Um, I think it's fantastic. I'm not like, I'm not like a book collector the way Karpov's a stamp collector. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to like hold on to them to gain value. I'm not buying the super expensive ones. But um, to me, there's just a natural pleasure that comes from sitting with a chess book and playing through the moves. Um, there's just something timeless about it to me. Um, so th that's what I enjoy most. And, and the fact that you know this this one game that so many words could be written about it and that there's still um you know a relatively large number of people who always want more like mm -hmm. that that fascinates me and i'm i'm one of those people that wants more so okay thank you very much and now a little bit of uh, i would say trivia Th this is going to be entertaining okay therefore okay. don't worry if you do not succeed okay because okay. it's not for success it's a little bit for entertainment because sometimes it's it's a little bit uh, important to make this stuff as well your task is to name 10 books that you recently have the contact with. It doesn't matter if you just read them, but at least you just listed them about them. The books are, of course, the uh, chess ones. And if you just put the book uh, title that I have on my library, I am making thumbs up. If I don't, thumbs down, thumbs down. Okay? Okay. So are you ready? Rattle off 10 books? Yes, rattle off. Okay. Evaluate like a grandmaster, Nate, Nate Solon and Eugene Perlstein. Next one. Uh, my system. Okay, uh, Masters of the Chess Board by Richard Reddy. Next one. Okay, uh, How to Reassess Your Chess. By, by the way, so by the way, I forgot one month stuff. Uh, recently published, right? Recently, oh, recently published, published, let's say re recent five years. Sorry about okay. one more time. Let's start. Uh, think Like a Super GM, Michael Adams. Okay, Under the Surface, Jan Markos. Um, let's see. Um, man, could it be that I'm drawing a blank? No um, problem. Arkell's Endings by Keith Arkell. Um, how about uh, Ramesh's Improve Your Calculation? Thinking Inside the Box by Agard. That's a good one. Um, Agard's Endgame book. I don't even know what it's called, um, even though I read it. Uh, a Matter of Endgame. Oh, uh, yeah, Matter of Endgame Technique. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me think. Uh, Chess for Hawks by the Cyrus Wakwadala, my friend. Uh -huh. um, Rewire Your Chess Brain by Cyrus. Um, let's see. Chess Queens. Got to give a shout out to my friend Jen. Yes, Jen Okay. 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 Yeah. Very good. Great. Thank you very much. I just, uh, out of, let's say, eight uh, that you j just mentioned, I just didn't have three. But some people are joking that I am having the ladder to get into the next floors. You know what I mean? <laughs> Therefore, I'm having that many books. And I right. need to I need to make decoration. It's a false statement. I just live in the headquarters of all of the books on the planet Earth related to chess. Therefore, now it's officially. Okay? Right. right. <laughs> okay, let's go for the next one. Neil Bruce, the habit guy, the chess reader and the legend plus his 10 years plan what do you think about him and his plan i think it's great he has so many insights like uh that i think have helped a lot of people um you know the my one my one critique of neil and he knows this is i think he needs to be playing more tournaments you know mm -hmm. he reads all these books and does all these flashcards mm -hmm. but you need to be in the arena you need, you need to, be to in practice the practice practice so that's my one critique but I love his long view and his modest goals. So for listeners who aren't, I mean, viewers, I'm used to having listeners, not viewers, uh -huh. um, who aren't familiar, he's on a 10-year plan to become USCF master. He's, it started with like, 
one game where he blundered colossally and he couldn't believe it. He like hung his queen. And he's like, I don't want that ever to happen again. So he started doing daily uh, tactics. He makes his own flashcards. He famously gets two copies of every book. Mm -hmm. um, and but, scissors and scissors. Yeah, cuts them up and makes <laughs> flashcards. Um, but what I love is his very uh, incremental goals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he like a lot of people read this famous book, um, Atomic Habits by yeah. James Clear. And one insight that I that I steal from Neil that I really appreciate from James Clear mm -hmm. is on days where he feels like he's struggling with motivation because he's he's a family guy, he's got a lot going on, he's got a you know successful career and stuff. He says that he identifies as a chess player. Mm -hmm. So he's always gonna do some chess every day because it's part of his identity. So that sort of like removes the decision point from from um you from your thinking process because you're not like oh should i do chess should i not do chess he just says this is part of who i am every day i do chess my identity some days, some days it's going to be five minutes some days it's going to be three hours mm -hmm. but i do chess every day and i i think of that a lot and i've uh incorporated that into my um my self-assessment as well mm -hmm. okay now just uh, if you can look at the uh, timer can we make eight minutes or is it too uh, much Let's do let's do five. Five if, okay, if five minutes. Five okay. Five yeah. up okay. But I'm gonna get a, my so my wife is at a meeting and if yeah. she gets home and I'm on a call, I'm gonna get in trouble with her. Of course, so of I just course. gotta get up there before she No gets problem, home. no problem. Five minutes. Okay. I'll I'll just a little bit of structure to make it happen. Three questions, each question one minute, and the bullet questions one minute. Okay? Okay, let's what, do it. Each question one minute and bullet questions one minute, and that's it. The first one. Okay. Chess over the board versus chess online. What are the pros and cons and is online chess and our future? Um, so over the board is way more intense. I learn way more, um, but you, it's really, it's expensive and it can be challenging to get there. Um, online chess, it's the ease of use. Um, and you know, there's different mouse tricks. You can learn things very quickly. You can like assimilate openings very quickly, but, um, I'm, I'm, I prefer OTB. Mm -hmm. The next question, chess dojo community and chess improvement. What do you think of the, of this method to uh, get better, to sign up into the program of chess, the dojo chess training program? So I did a video with Jesse Cry where they showed me around and roped me in. So I did join it. I think it's great for, especially for people who are looking for training games. I do find their suggestions a little bit rigid in terms of what you're doing, but community is such an important part mm -hmm. of, um, of sticking with chess and uh, not feeling like you're all alone that I think that what they're doing is fantastic. And I'm big fans of uh, the Chess Dojo. Can you say that you recommend this program for others? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it depends somewhat on your needs, but if you're looking for uh, training partners mm -hmm. um, and people to just go over games together, then 100%. If, if that's not what you're looking for, then maybe, maybe not. Okay, got it. The last question and the bullet questions, just two seconds for, for, for each, okay? Very quickly. Chess coaches, okay. instructors, and teachers, can, and, can anybody become one? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, it's, it's different in different places, but um, a, here in the U.S., scholastic programs are huge. So mm -hmm. anyone can reach like a 13, 1400 level. I feel, uh, you know, with work, anyone can get to that level. And if you get to that level and you're a good communicator, you can make decent money as a chess teacher. Um, in different places, it might be different, but um, certainly like um, if you can find a way to differentiate yourself online, then I think you might need to be a little higher rated but I do think you can you can uh, f have some students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And now last 40 seconds, 40 seconds bullet questions, okay? One of the, okay. one of the questions, uh, sorry, one of the answer you just chose. The first one, chess or poker? Oh, chess is better. Attack or defend? Uh, attack. Chess podcast or chess video? Podcast, obviously. Free chess session with a grandmaster, coach, or lunch with an NBN star? Um... Uh, I gotta say NBA, I talk to these chess guys all the time. <laughs> okay, grinding towards FIDE Master title or watching others suffering? Uh, grinding. Okay, Neil Bruce or Dr. Kevin Skull? Oh man, that's a tough one. Yeah. Both, both great guys. Okay, um, both. I'll go with Neil, he puts the work in. Okay. Apologies to Kevin, but... Okay, teaching chess or a two year, eight years old student or playing over the board please with your friends? Uh, obviously the latter. <laughs> okay. Checkmating King Bishop Knight or winning King Queen versus King Rook? Uh, King and Queen versus Rook. Okay. The, f the last three. Sleeping or watching? Uh, watching. Reading or listening? Reading. Riding a bike or running? Uh, running. 
Okay, thank you very much for being with us. I hope we just make it. I really, really appreciated your work for our community, Ben. And if you have anything to say to our audience, it's just the last 10 seconds. Sure, thanks to anyone watching. And Tomas, I'm sorry, like, I'll, I'll, I'd be happy perfectly to do it fine. again sometime if uh, It's if perfectly want, fine, Ben. I, I did mean to stay a bit longer. Perfectly fine. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Take care and keep a great stuff going. Will do. Goodbye, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, bye-bye.